All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Modern Day Debate. Filling in for James today is me. It was pointless. So anyway, here we go. We're getting ready to take it on. I know that uh, James isn't here right now because he's off busy getting his pictures taken for the next GQ magazine cover. So everyone wish him luck. Anyway, we're going to be talking about the debate today is going to be on the best evidence and the reasons for the fossil record. If this is your first time here, considering hitting that subscribe button as we're trying to build a community with people from all walks of life. Also, before we get started, I just wanted to your first time here. here. Well, I just wanted to let everybody know that if you enjoy the speakers, you can find the links to their descriptions below for their channels. And you can find them on their channels there. Also, um, as for the debate today, the format's going to be a five minute opening for each person. And then it's going to move to a 40 minute rebuttal session where it's two minutes for each person back and forth, followed by at the end of this, a 10 minute discussion portion for each. And then it's going to be three minutes closing. closing. So also there's super chats options. So if anybody sends any of these and you want to make a comment to any of these people, post it. And uh, before they speak, I'll read it out loud. Also, the debaters are, today are going to be standing for truth and Nephilim free versus the snake was right and the emotionally stunted Emojicon was actually looking to extend that name. So if you can help, I'm just kidding. He's not. <laughs> All right. So everybody, let's get started. I'm going to start the timer and standing for truth. Are you ready? You're going to start. I, I am ready there, Matt. Thanks for hosting. Thanks, guys, for doing this. Snake, emotionally stunted Emoticon. That's tough to say 10 times fast, even, even tougher than Toy Boat. Guys, say Toy Boat 10 times fast. You'll have fun. Anyway, thanks for thanks Nav for being my uh, being my partner here, and yeah, I guess I'm starting with uh, with my five minutes. You're saying? Correct. Yep, I'll start it whenever you start. Okay. Um, let me see. I'm trying to share screen here, but it's not. I go to share screen. The share part's not highlighted. Chat's saying there's an audio issue. We better uh, solve the sure audio the before we begin. Was, I can't hear anything. All right. Well, standing for truth, you don't have to go first. Um, would somebody else like to go first while you work out the technique? Wait, Matt. Uh, wait, Matt somebody, uh, Taylor said that people are saying there's an audio issue in the room. In the so there's room. nobody. nobody can hear us? Uh, it just says audio issue. You probably have OBS taking, okay. taking the computer said, audio. Somebody they said, say we have a doubling of the audio. Uh, okay, Matt, you may have the audio for the watch page running. Click the audio stop. The mute, mute the video on the watch page. That might be it. And uh, for emotionally stunned emoticon, is your how's your connection? I know that your um, your service is not used to. Chat says that your internet connection me. okay. Yeah, so I think my connection is okay. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh wonderful. I don't have anything open, so I don't know why. There's a sound. Maybe they were having lag issues. I don't know. But I know you can get a double feed if you if you got the audio playing for the uh, watch page while you're in the hangout. You'll have you'll have double audio going. Yeah, I don't have that open. There's on my side. I don't know. Do you think we should? I can stop the broadcast. Do you think we should? Yeah, maybe stop the broadcast, remake it, and then reinvite everybody, and we'll try well, that. Well, wait. Um, somebody's saying we had a couple of people say they can hear us in the chat. Okay, I don't know why. So I'm going to the I'm going to click share screen, but then the share part's not highlighted. I can't click it. Oh, really? Chrome wants to open another browser. Okay, we okay. Have... No, I, I think I got it. I think I got it. There can it you is. see? Yes. Okay, we're okay. we're all a bunch of Gomer piles for right now. Whenever you want to start the timer, uh, oh. Matt, I'm good to go. Okay, I'll start. Okay, on. good to go. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, 
What best explains the fossil record? The global flood of Noah, of course. When we start with God's word as our final authority, that authoritative eyewitness account of, say, Earth's history, the history of the universe, the fossil record is absolutely consistent with the global cataclysmic Genesis flood. It explains numerous things that we see. For example, we see rock layers with marine fossils covering the continents, which is obviously a result of a global flood. Unimaginable numbers of plant and animal fossils are found in extensive graveyards where they had to be buried rapidly on a massive scale. Billions and billions of these fossils. Often the fossil remains are found in the famous death pose. But first of all, what do we find in the fossil record? Let's take a look at the fossil record itself, guys. Over 95% of all fossils are shallow marine organisms, such as corals and shellfish. 95% of the remaining 5% are algae and plants. 95% of the remaining 0.25% are invertebrates, including insects. Now the remaining 0.0125% are vertebrates, mostly fish. 95% of land vertebrates consist of less than one bone and 95% of mammal fossils are from the ice age after the flood. That's why when the evolutionists look to lining up specific fossils to prove their evolutionary theory, a lot of times they're cherry picking on such limited data. The fact is each basic plant and animal type appeared abruptly and fully functional and the ex and they experienced stasis throughout its existence. Each type was complex and distinct right from the start. Now, at the end of the day, many of the Earth's fossil bearing layers, they stretch over entire continents. Some of the sandstone layers, for example, in North America reach from California to New England. Numerous peculiar fossils have been found that defy a trank quill fossilization event. For example, we see an ichthyosaur mother in the, in the process of giving birth. It was preserved in the rock layers. It doesn't take millions and millions of years to give birth, my friends. It's difficult, very difficult to imagine that these creatures froze in position, slowly sank to the ocean bottom, and then were slowly covered with sediment in a manner that avoided scavenging or any other type of disturbance. Instead, a rapid catastrophic burial seems much more likely. In addition to ind individual fossils, we now have data, plenty of data, suggesting that entire fossil beds were the result of catastrophic burial. So what the fossil record supports is massive death and burial on a global scale. This is exactly what the Bible describes. Second Peter 3 tells us in the last days there's going to be scoffers denying three things, the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment. This debate right here is fulfilled prophecy. These evolutionists here, they reject and scoff and deny all three of those things. Specifically here in this debate, the global flood. The world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The existence of a fossil is proof positive that it happened quickly. Environmental factors prevent that organism from forming, but it's covered by sediment and protected. The fossilization process can start. How much more time do I have, Matt? One minute. Okay. Well, at the end of the day, I think it's pretty obvious that the fossil record in geology proved biblical creation in the Genesis flood. We see rapid or no erosion between sediment layers. We see flat featureless boundaries. We find whole rock layer sequences deposited rapidly in quick succession. Look at the walls of the Grand Canyon, for example. From the tapete at the bottom to the Kaibab limestone at the top, it's supposed to be representing 300 million years of slow and gradual sedimentary deposition. When the plateau was pushed up, those rock layers were bent and folded, but they were folded without fracturing. They had to be soft, of course, if they were bent without fracturing. That means they could have only just been deposited. This means that 300 million years never happened that these evolutionists believe in. Uniformitarianism is pseudoscience. All those rock layers had to be rapidly deposited in quick succession in the flood year. 15 seconds. 
Awesome. You know what? I know uh, Neff here is going to have a lot of good things to say. So I'm going to give up those 15 seconds and let uh, let my teammate here, Neff, take over. Thanks, guys. All right, Neff. When you're ready, I'll start time. Okay. You can begin. Uh, it is fulfilled prophecy, brother. Are, are, are you seeing what I'm sharing on the screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, this is a fossil of uh, what's called an ostracod. It's a tiny little bitty creature, a fraction of an inch long. Look at the state of preservation of this tiny little bitty creature that will easily you could fit numerous ones on your finger, on your pinky fingernail. It's astonishing to get a fossil of a creature this small, this incredibly well preserved. That can only happen rapidly, as my uh, uh, astute uh, 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 um, a partner has stated. Fossilization requires heavily mineralized water to rapidly create a fossil. A fossilization cannot take weeks, months, or years. It takes place in days, to, uh, and that's it. Or you'll never get a fossil. Here's a fish. Individual cells of this fish have been preserved. It's allegedly 100 million years old. Individual cells were fossilized. Here is preserved cellular structure of a fish's gills, allegedly 100 million years old. This kind of detailed fossilization can only happen rapidly. These tissues will degrade very rapidly by the action of bacteria or, and, and uh, or scavenging unless it happens rapidly. The, the conditions to create a fossil record only existed on this planet once, and that was during the flood of Noah. Only the flood of Noah can explain the geologic column. Only the flood of Noah can explain the fossil record that exists in the geologic column because you simply cannot get uh, fine uh, intricate tissues like this to become fossils over a period of months. It will not happen. It will degrade rapidly. This, These are individual cells that are, are embryos that are fossilized. The first one is one single cell. The next one is where it splits into two and four, eight, 16, 32, etc. It goes from one cell, two cells, four cells, eight cells, and 16 cells. This can only happen rapidly. A single cell will degrade very rapidly in water. It will, osmosis alone should cause it to burst. How do you get this? Only highly mineralized water and rapid fossilization under heat could possibly do it, explain it. So the fossil record can only be explained now, my fr by the flood, my friend touched upon the death pose. That's a beautiful thing to talk about. We find that whenever we find do dinosaur fossils and large animal fossils in the, in the fossil record, they often seem to be very prominently often seem to be in this called death pose. Look how this animal's neck is bent backwards all the way back. And this one, its neck is contorted backwards. These are real fossils. Here's a fossil in sandstone, I believe. The neck is all the way back. And here's another. The heads are turned back. Here's a here's an animal. Uh, this is a large creature, I believe, a T-Rex. Look how its head is up. It's lying on its back. It didn't fall dead and lay on the ground and die. This creature was buried immediately in thick sediments, and it stuck its head up while it was choking and flailing and choking on sediments and died in sediments. It died rapidly. When a creature this large falls dead, it doesn't stick its head up. This, this dinosaur stuck its head straight up in the air as it's choking to death on sediments because it was rapidly buried by the flood of Noah. Here's another. The neck is bent almost all the way backward. This not only indicates the creature was struggling to breathe, but it also indicates the waters that brought the sediments that were thick and moving rapidly because it washed the animal's head and forced it backward towards the rest of its body. It was facing the oncoming flood. Here's that T-Rex. I believe it's a T-Rex. Its head stuck straight up in the air. How do you explain this with uniformitarianism? It's impossible. This gigantic creature that weighed multiple tons was choking to death on sediments and stuck its head up in the air, gasping for air, which it could not get. Its throat was filled with sediment, and it choked to death. 30 seconds. This is because the flood of Noah is a geologic fact. There's more physical evidence for the flood of Noah 
than there is for anything else in all of science. Denying the flood of Noah is to deny geology. And that, with that, I conclude my presentation. All right. All right, then. Stunted Emojicon or Snake was right. You can debate who wants to go next. And... Um, I decided to go next. Um, okay. so I think I would start. I think I would start now. All right. All right. Uh, so before I go on, I would just like to introduce myself again. I go by the Emotionally Stunted Emoticon, or you can just call me Stunted for short. Um, I hope you guys can understand me. I have an accent. Actually, this is a, a mild version of the accent, I, you know, so that I can speak with a North American audience. Um, so the, the debate is uh, what best explains a fossil record. Um, I don't think a single flood, a single deluge explains the arrangement of, um, you know, life in the fossil record. Uh, for example, um, creationists will talk about hydrologic sorting. That, that's, uh, I think that's Kent Hovind's argument. Um, that the, the more dense creatures would settle at the bottom and so on. But every time they make that argument, they would start from the Cambrian. But life and the fossil record doesn't start at the Cambrian. It starts where before that. Uh, there are layers that represent the first three, maybe 3.5 billion years of Earth's history. And it only consists of microbes. So I'm not too sure if the microbes are more dense than the creatures in the Cambrian, or I don't know how hydrologic certain works. Um, uh, so, some, something else that is very peculiar is that um, even though they argue hydrologic sorting for the animals, the rocks the animals are encased in is not arranged by density. So that is something else again. Um, there is an argument I was making with... Um, standing for truth, a, a question I asked in one of the debates is why we don't find um, like bony fish or um, modern crabs or true crabs or sharks and so on in the Cambrian or any marine tetrapods in the Cambrian. Um, if, if the flood buried things by, you know, ecosystems or whatever, why aren't there no fish there? Um, obviously on the evolutionary model, the reason why you don't find any bony fish or sharks or whatever is because they hadn't evolved as yet. Um, something else to note is that in, in regard to the marine tetrapods is you never find a marine tetrapod before um, the basal ancestor of that, um, of that form. For example, um, you'd never find mosasaurs and plesiosaurs before the origin of reptiles or before the origin of uh, tetrapods themselves. Um, you'd never find whales before the origins of mammals or manatees before the origins of mammals, all because they hadn't evolved yet. They had, because evolution is a sequential process, you have to get mammals first before you get marine mammals. Or you have to get reptiles first before you get marine reptiles. Um, and yeah, you have to get tetrapods first before you get marine tetrapods. So that's actually what you see in the fossil record. Um, something else that always... Um, I was always confused by as well is the, the things that the flood seems to preserve and how it preserves it is you would find things like fossilized raindrops, you would find fossilized footprints, trackways, and you would find fossilized eggs or even egg nests. And these things would be sandwiched between layers that would lay down by the flood, the same flood. So it, it's curious to know what kind of flood dynamics would be able to explain, uh, you know, a flood laying down layers and then sandwiching an egg nest fully formed between there. Um, uh, let me see. Um, I guess that's, that's it for my opening. Uh, we, we would discuss the rest in the discussion period. All right. Snake, when you are ready, we will begin. All right. I'm going to share my screen real quick here. Okay. So my main arguments are going to be showing how ridiculous most of the claims of the Noah's Flood are. Um, first of all is to see how small this boat actually is supposed to be. It's much smaller than the Titanic even, and yet it was supposed to have carried all the species on the planet, uh, and we currently have 10 billion species today. Um, there's no way that would ever fit on the boat. So the only response to that is that there were 16,000 
approximately kinds, or they call them barramans, were on this boat, um, plus food and clean water for them and all the other necessities, um, plus somehow all of humanity's sexually transmitted diseases, all of the diseases on the entire planet, all of the disparate species, uh, all of them crammed into this one tiny boat. Um, and those 16,000 somehow evolved into the 10 billion species that we see today in just 4,000 years. And so that pretty much already admits the theory of evolution. Um, and the fossil record provides plenty of transitions between all of them. Um, to deny this is like finding someone with a knife sticking out of them and then wondering how they died. It's pretty obvious. Um, hydrologic sorting doesn't make any sense. If there was any kind of sorting method, I'd love to know how the waters are able to separate by species. Um, in a normal flood, we'd actually see everything mixed up pretty homogeneously. Uh, all of the types of creatures all mixed up together in a pretty even fashion. But yet what we see is organized layers uh, that trend from oldest to youngest towards modern uh, forms, and it shows a gradual series of changes towards modern forms. Um, this can easily be falsified with with just one verifiable instance of a Precambrian mammal, for instance. Uh, instead, they can only produce things like supposed human footprints in the same layers of dinosaurs. Uh, and yet, if you actually investigate this for yourself, you'll see that in the same row of footprints that is supposedly human prints, they have three-toed dinosaur prints, some of which just appear to be filled in with mud. Um, let's see. So the other argument about uh, hydrologic sorting is that it sorts by environment uh, and ecosystem. But this, is, this makes no sense because this would create a map that essentially would look like a bullseye with humans in the middle because, that, because they live inland. So how would these layers organize by species and by environment, yet we have them organized exactly how I've described. How would a flood, a single flood do this? Um, and I heard a lot about, uh, about these animals that were buried quickly. And yes, most fossils are formed in floods. And so the argument here essentially was, Neff's entire argument was a flood happened somewhere, therefore Noah's flood was the only flood. Um, you know, most fossils are buried rapidly, but you can't just assume this was all a single flooding event because floods happen all over the world, um, as well as uh, dinosaur soft tissues. This is an oft-repeated lie about soft tissues that they can't be preserved. Um, the discoverer uh, of these dinosaur soft tissues, Mary Schweitzer, she's a devout Christian. She discovered this and studied these tissues and published multiple papers explaining exactly what kind of chemistry creates this kind of preservation and in that specific soft tissue. Um, and it wasn't the whole soft tissue, it was only very specific ones that are preserved by these uh, iron. Um, and as far as uh, people who scoff at the flood and everything, well, geology is firmly against Noah's flood. Uh, especially Christians who made the original discoveries that refuted the flood model, uh, known as, uh, I think is catastrophism. Um, and so pointing out the scoffers doesn't really do much for your case because predicting that people will laugh at your religion is not a prophecy of anything, but uh, the fact that your faith is it's a prophecy that your faith is unbelievable. I mean, the, the Muslims have plenty of warnings about this. Uh, should I just go and convert to Islam just because they told me to? Um, I don't think so. Uh, how much time do I have left? Sorry, I was muted. Oh. You're good. That was your time, actually. Okay. 
All right. So now we're going to move on to the, dis not discussion, but the two minute back and forth for um, the rebuttal period. So I guess since Standing for Truth started, we're going back to him. And so you guys are both going to get uh, uh, two minutes each on whoever wants to go first on answering emotion stunted and snake i know they cover a lot but i can start i think okay. since i opened i can start in the rebuttal round sure okay yep. begin when you got okay thank you well uh looks like emotionally stunted emoticon you know he assumed evolution um a few times there and at the end of the day you know what do we observe we observe bacteria producing bacteria but he believes you know bacteria today came from something that was that was non-bacteria we can see in the lensky experiment that you know bacteria produce more bacteria of course that doesn't mean that bacteria pine trees and whales are related through common ancestry because we see devolution and not evolution so evolutionists like emotion here you know he imagines that all these small scale variations are, are going to eventually add up to make something we don't actually observe so you know he's imagining that mutations make something new and better but it's it's not what we see we actually see the opposite so he assumes that and therefore he interprets the fossil record according to that um he also talked a lot about ecosystems hydrologic sorting you know um why don't we find certain fossils in certain layers he'll say you've got this type of fossil in this layer and these types of fossils in these layers and he thinks that it goes from marine fossils to land fossils in the order of evolution he's assumed evolution but we know evolution large scale ponds come to people evolution it's not true based on the observed evidence so this is incorrect we've got marine fossils all the way through Okay, even with dinosaur fossils, we've got marine fossils buried with them. In fact, the order that we actually see, the order of, of the fossils, is the burial order of the flood. And so the flood began, say, in the ocean, according to our model of flood geology, ripping up all those marine creatures and burying them onto the continents. They would be the first creatures to be buried. And so the, the flood waters rose higher. You get the burial of the land animals. And this is exactly what we find and expect. You know, he, he ignores all the evidence of fossils. Everywhere we look at the end of the day, there's an abundant evidence from geology that the flood really did occur. Nothing in the fossils support evolution. He assumes evolution. What the fossil actually, the fossil record actually supports is massive death and burial on a global scale. Did you say that was time, Matt? No, that was 15 seconds earlier, but it's time now. Yeah, so that's exactly what the Bible describes. Got more points written down that flew by, so I'll address them after. Go ahead, Neff. Okay, so my my, uh, my partner correctly uh, ruined the argument about the uh, sorting of the geologic column. Creatures are, are, are buried in the geologic column according to mobility and environment, not according to the uniformitarianist belief about the fossils. Uh, the evolutionist time scale. Virtually every eminent science uh, uh, scientist in the world who has ever written a book about evolution in the geologic column has acknowledged the fossil record is void of transitional fossils. They'll tell university students, there's plenty of them, but then they write books for their peers to review, which they which they cannot tell the lie about because all their peers would raise their eyebrow and say, is this guy nuts? And they would ruin their career. So they have to tell the truth in their books about the fossil record, and they all acknowledge the fossil record does not show, it does not document the evolution of, of, of creatures, which would have to be true if you lose them or true. Uh, David B. Kitts, professor of geology, University of Oklahoma. Despite the bright promise that paleontology provides a means of seeing evolution, it has presented some nasty difficulties for evolutionists, the most notorious of which is presence of gaps in the fossil record. Now, pay attention to this statement. Evolution requires intermediate forms between species and paleontology does not provide them. Is this man, did he jeopardize his career by saying the truth in this book? Of course not, because all geologists and paleontologists agree. Even those who believe evolution, Stephen Jay Gould, the most famous paleontologist the world has seen so far, said stasis or non-change of most fossil species during their lengthy geological spans is was tacitly acknowledged by all paleontologists, but also never studied explicitly because prevailing theory treated stasis as uninteresting non-evidence for non-evolution. The overwhelming prevalence of stasis became an embarrassing feature of the fossil record, best left ignored and manifest as nothing that is non-evolution 
and I can show you more of these. It's in, evolution is not documented by the fossil record. Had evolution been true, there would be billions of transitional forms in the fossil record. 15 seconds. There would be more transitional forms in the fossil record than there are fully formed creatures. And therefore, we can say by the physical historical evidence of life on this planet, evolution did not happen. Uh, and that, I conclude. All right. Uh, um, so I, I think I would go next and then Snake would go after. Okay. All right. Um, so I would start with um, Standing for Truth. He said... Uh, we're not talking about evolution, but um, he said that Alensky's experiment, bacteria produce bacteria. Um, bacteria is not a species, it's actually a domain. So saying that is the same as saying it's still a eukaryote. It's the same thing we say. You're saying the same thing just with bacteria. Um, uh, you made a claim, uh, you say um, multiple times about you know things coming from non-things. Yes, dogs can come from non-dogs. They came from wolves. Um, in the same way, cabbages and kale and broccoli came from something that was not a kale, cabbage and broccoli. It came from a mustard. But since they're all brassica, the law of monophyly still applies. Um, same with camels. Um, camels and llamas descend from something that was neither camel nor llama, but they're all camelids. So then the, mo the law of monophyly still applies. Um, if you want to go with pine trees and whales, pine trees and whales descend from something that was not a pine tree, not a whale. It descended from a, a eukaryotic common ancestor. Since they're all eukaryotes, the law of monophyly still applies. All right. Um, what else? Um, I did, I, oh my gosh, I did just one more thing. Okay, so I'll just leave that there. Uh, let me just go on to the uh, the fossil record now. Um, as I stated, um, for example, marine mammals like whales and so on, they're never found below the origin of, uh, of, of mammals. You don't find whales and uh, manatees and so on, for example, back in the time of the dinosaurs because uh, marine mammals didn't evolve that, at that time. So it's curious. I'm curious as to how you would have all that um, fossil history uh, without whales and then all of a sudden you have whales. How is the geologic, ge um, hydrological sorting sorting these animals? And then again, the rocks itself is not sorted by in, in any kind of uh, way that would suggest that it was sorted by a, a single event. Um, um, I don't know if you it, it touched on the eggs and so on yet, because that, that is something I really want to know. What kind of flood dynamic could preserve an egg nest? That's the time? No, 15 seconds. Go ahead. 15 seconds. Yeah, so I, I really want to know what kind of flood dynamics can preserve things like uh, raindrops and uh, footprints between layers that was laid down by the same flood. Um, I don't know if organisms were walking while the flood was happening, while you know sediments were being deposited. So that's what I really want to know, what kind of dynamics would cause that. All right. Thank you. And Snake, you are up. You're muted. I won't start time. My bad. OK. Uh... So I wanted to address the typical arguments made by Nephilim uh, about the, the supposed quotes by all these evolutionists that debunk evolution. Uh, he ne knowingly takes these quotes out of context, cuts them up, uh, pastes them together, or drops parts off completely. Uh, he's trying to make it seem like the mainstream science doesn't support evolution when he knows full well and admitted to me in the, our last discussion about this, uh, that these quotes are referring uh, to punctuated equilibrium versus gradualism. They, what he, they're hearing is they're rejecting the idea of gradualism and they're promoting the idea of punctuated equilibrium. For example, Nephilim will say things like, Stephen Jay Gould said the fossil record with its abrupt transitions offers no support for gradual change. And then he'll cut it off right there and neglect to finish his sentence uh, which goes, and the principle of natural selection does not require it. Selection can op uh, operate rapidly. And that was in 1980, and in a subsequent uh, book in 1997, he had also said, the sequential discovery of picture intermediacy in the evolution of whales stands as a triumph in the history of paleontology. So he's just trying to lie and uh, make it seem like 
uh, the mainstream science does not support transitional fossils. Meanwhile, I'm going to read off uh, several papers that actually support this uh, terminology and these ideas, such um, from NCBI, transition of Eocene whales from land to sea, evidence of bone and microstrutter, uh, anatomy, feeding ecology, and ontogeny of a transitional baleen whale. Uh, the Royal Society talks about transitional anthropoid fossils. So this is just a lie spun to take things out of context and make it sound like the actual sciences don't support these things. Um, let's see, I'll end with, uh, how much time do I have? 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, from Dr. Colin Patterson talking about these kind of uh, taking quotes out of context, he says that our interpretation, uh, the evolutionist, is correct and the creationist is false. So there you have it. All right, thanks. Standing for truth, you're up. Start time when you begin. No, wait a minute, it was, it was me that's up. Oh, my bad, all right. Whoever wants to go first here. No, I, I, think, I think it goes me, then Neff, emotion, then snake, me, then Neff. You got this, right, Matt? Yeah, it is a matter of your team. Well, wait a minute. Um, everybody's gone but me, so it comes back around to me right now, right? No, I, th I think you had your. I think you had your. You did your opening, and then you did a rebuttal. Right, and then you guys, and then Emoticon did, and now Taylor did. And then it would go back to. Oh, that, I'm, back I'm, to me. I'm sorry. Are we on discussion period. I'm yet? sorry. No, it's you. You again, then me. Okay. So yeah, so. it's yeah, exactly. Okay. So th so this would be second round, right, Matt? Second of how many yeah. rounds? Um. We have out of 40 minutes, so I don't know, probably okay. five rounds. Okay, okay. My, my bad. I'm sorry. I, I was Just let me know when to go. You're, you're good. I'll start the time whenever you're ready. Okay, so emotion there talks a lot about the law of monophyly. Of course, the law of monophyly is consistent with biblical creation and not pond scum to people evolution. Let's get right into the fact that, you know, he likes to look at the fossil record in general and the animals and, and fossils that are living with what and fossils that are not living with another. Let's use dinosaurs, for example. Just because human bones and aren't found with dinosaur bones does not mean that they didn't live together at the same time, okay? Animals can live together on the same planet and yet still never cross paths. So it's, it's an argument from, from ignorance. Let's look at the coelacanth, for example, or the Willemi pine, for example. It was once thought by evolutionists like Snake and Emotion here that the coelacanth and the Willemi pine became extinct. The coelacanth, for example, they believe came, became extinct about 70 million years ago. And this was because their fossils were not found in any deposits higher than this. And yet we have found these creatures living today. This proves that animals that are not buried together doesn't mean that they didn't live together. They lived in different environments. The Willemi pine, for example, which which was fossilized in, in Jurassic deposits supposedly 150 million years ago. And we found them today. The list of living fossils is literally endless. And it's becoming more and more difficult for the evolutionary model of fish to fishermen evolution to stand in the face of this great number of living fossils. There's problem after problem after problem. He did touch on evolution a, a bit, but what we know about observable science, not the fossil record, looking at some bone found in the dirt, it's just not true. The human mutation rate is approximately 100 new mutations per person per generation. And so that indicates that mutations are entering the human population at a rate much faster than natural selection could ever possibly select away such mutations. These low impact deleterious mutations are degenerating our information system. On every continent, we find fossils of sea creatures and rock layers that today are high above sea level. Often the, the, the fine details of the creatures are amazingly preserved. They ignore all the data, they cherry pick, they hope, they dream that and imagine that pine trees and whales are, are related through common ancestry in spite of what we know about observable um, evidence. I'll touch on everything else later. All right, emotionally. You ready? You're muted. Emotionally stunted. You are up. You're muted. No, it, it's Nath. It goes me, then Nath. Oh, sorry. The yeah, it's, it's Nath's it's Nath turn. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Nath. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. 
Right. Okay, so to respond to the uh, rain marks, uh, the, on the left you see a photograph of what the evolutionists claim are uh, rain marks uh, preserved in the fossil record, and on the right are what you see are actual preserved rain marks. They are not rain marks. What the evolutionists claim are rain marks that are preserved in the fossil in the geologic column that prove the flood of Noah didn't happen because there was rain slapping on the earth, uh, supposedly while the flood was occurring, are not rain marks. The ones on the right are modeled and random patterned because they're rain marks. These, whatever they are, and scientists have studied them and can't even know what they are. They're not sure, but they are not rain marks. These are rain marks. Those are not rain marks. So there are no rain marks in the geologic column that show evolution, uh, the, the uniformitarian time frame. Now here, here you can see New Orleans before Katrina and after Katrina. Now, if you want to believe that hundreds of millions of years took place, and quadrillions of tons of material don't erode from the coasts of the continents during that time that you're living in a delusion. Because this was one single hurricane that washed away trillions and trillions of tons of land mass into the oceans. If uniformitarianism were true, and hundreds of millions of years of time existed in the past, and the flood of Noah wasn't true, we wouldn't even have a continent. The continents would erode in 20 million years, if you do the math. Okay, This is an erosion remnant. That's the throat of a volcano. Look at the pediment right there that is built up at the bottom of it. There's not hundreds of millions of years worth of that stuff there. There's thousands of years worth. The flood of Noah took place only thousands of years ago. This is called a ship rock in northwestern Arizona. That's the material that's built up, that's fallen away, eroded from this giant rock mass sticking up out of the earth about a quarter of a mile high. That's it. That's all there is. If, you, if millions of years existed, the whole thing would be gone. There wouldn't just be this little pile of stuff 40, 50 feet high. Time. I'm sorry. Sorry. Time. Okay. Two minutes goes quick, I know. <laughs> All right. It really does, yeah. <laughs> All right, emotion it. You're up. Um, so um I, I guess I, I would touch on the um stasis. Uh uh Standard for Truth mentioned stasis. Um stasis is an argument, um it's not a serious argument, it's not an argument to be taken seriously. Uh mostly anytime you see that argument, it's a meme or a blog post. It's never a scientific publication um, that argues against uh, the stasis, you know, refutes evolution. Um, anytime that argument is brought up with stasis, they always ignore the actual diversity within the, the type of organism they're talking about. Um, the Walmy pine, for example, is, it's not in isolation. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, a species of pine that is related to other species of pines and conifers and cycads. So I would be. I, I would like to know if they're all related, and if they're all related, it would mean that they evolved. Uh, just because a lineage remain remain morphologically stable doesn't mean evolution is not occurring. Um, I, I've seen this argument used before on wolves. Uh, someone would show a wolf from forty thousand years or whatever thousand years ago, and they would say, "Look, the modern day wolf looks exactly like this wolf," ignoring the fact that dogs came from wolves. So anytime you see that argument, it always ignores the actual diversity within the. Um, within the type of organism they're talking about. Um, and again, stasis only applies to gross morphology. The genome always evolves uh, based on the, the mechanism of uh, reproduction uh, recombination. So the genome must evolve. Uh, it's only based on gross morphology. Uh, paleontologists actually can distinguish species within the fossil record and you know, distinguish them from their extant counterparts. Sometimes they write entire papers on just a joint or something. Uh, so it's exquisite details to, to show the differences, and they even have mathematical equations to quantify these differences. Uh, so it's it's not like these animals are not evolving. It's just that some lineages remain morphologically morphologically stable because of how evolution works. It's a usually a lineage splitting process. So uh, when the, the the population splits, uh, some of it can change, and then the the ones that remain in the, the you know the environment would remain morphologically stable. Um, that ties into the um, punctuated equilibrium. Um, what happens is uh, the fine gradations you would expect between pairs of species, you wouldn't really find them because what happens is when a species 
is stable. It, it remains, you know, kind of the same. And then when it shifts into a new environment, the transition is usually a short period until they reach in a new environment and then they adapt again. So what happened is you'd have like species remaining for millions of years in one form and then they would shift and the change happens in a few thousand years and then they stay a million years or so in the, in the next form. Uh, that's it. That's my time? Time, yeah. Time, oh, well, okay. All right, Snake. All right. Um, all right, well, they like to invoke geology until the geologists uh, disagree with them. Uh, and to one of Neff's points if, about the, the freestanding rock in the middle of the desert, if millions of the past, it would all be gone. Uh, well, most of it is gone. Just look around the whole thing. The whole desert, most of it's gone. There's only tiny, tiny scraps left. And again, I trust the expert geologists over Nephilim Free. Um, and again, uh, small scale variation can add up to create different forms, and we see this in the fossil record in a sequence by date. And so this is exactly akin to finding a dead body with a knife and saying, we can't prove that this guy was stabbed because we never actually saw it. Um, but small-scale variation can add up to create different forms. Uh, and this is admitted based on bare mineralogy and the fact that all the 16,000 forms that came off the ark would have had to diversify into all the 10 billion species we see today. Um, but the creationists can't understand how small changes add up to things like whales, even though we have every step that has been predicted in the fossil record in a sequential, in a dated sequence. Uh, in that sequential order that we're looking for, uh, such as a mammal losing hair, getting a higher set of nostrils, getting stiff webbed hands and arms, getting stunted back legs and a flatter, bigger tail. These are all small scale within kind variation, but somehow they can't figure out why these wouldn't be able to add up in the same population. They just dogmatically assert that it can't be because their idea is based on a storybook rather than real predictive science. And the difference there is also that their idea is completely inflexible to new information. Is that it? No, 15 seconds, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's about what I was gonna end anyway. All right, standing for truth, you were up. Okay, awesome. It looks like I emotionally uh, stunted Emoticon there, kind of wasted his entire time because a lot of imagination, a lot of stories. I know that's what they believe. I know that's their ideas, but there's no actual evidence for the things that they say in regards to small scale evolution leading to large scale evolution over time. Fish to fishermen say biological evolution. Yes, it means a change in allele frequencies and in populations over time or, in, or generations, but that type of micro evolutionary variation you know where we're going to get the frequency of a, a change in the frequency of the expression of different traits over time is not really disputed they need to show us not the small scale variation but the major innovations the major origin events major origin events of major new forms of life new structures novel information we don't see that type of change because all new innovation structures, body plans, novel information, based on what we know about natural selection and mutation, mutations are the destroyer, not the creator. They cannot be the result of natural selection acting upon random variation and random mutations. It's science fiction, religion. They ignore all the geology, all the obvious catastrophic processes that would explain the fossil record. And we actually have the testable and falsifiable predictions. For one, poly straight fossils that extend through many layers of rock completely destroy all their assumptions of the geological column uniformitarian processes macro evolution now at the end of the day when we look at the continents today they're moving very little but when we look to noah's flood we aren't looking at continent continental drift anymore we're actually looking at continental sprint meters per second movement of of the plates of the continents this model CPT, it predicts that the pre-flood ocean crust would be dragged down into the mantle exactly. in a process that we actually call subduction process. Now, because that happened recently, only a few thousand years ago, according to our model, the cold ocean crust should still be cold, even though it has descended into the deep hot mantle. We've made the predictions. I want to I want to hear what predictions they've made and confirm predictions because modern seismologists have actually discovered that there are indeed 
huge cold slabs of rock down near the core itself in areas that should actually have warmed. Time. They should have warmed up if, if millions of years worth of time or what would have brought those slabs down instead of Noah's flood. So I, I know you just said time. Just wanted to finish that sentence. We got more predictions. I'll go into them later. I want to hear predictions from you guys because the evidence is in our court. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, Neff, you are up. All right. Um, I, just to uh, quickly um, refute the statement that we heard from Taylor, uh, the the ark couldn't have held all the, the, the creatures that we see in the world, so the flood can't be true. Am I screen sharing? Can somebody tell me, please? Yes, it's fine. Th thank you. Um, that's a false argument, and evolutionists know it's a false argument, because the, the ark didn't have to house all the varieties of living things, just the original kinds. From them, you can get many, many varieties. From one spider, you could get thousands of varieties. There are dozens of different roaches roaches in the world, all of them come from a roach. So the ark didn't have to hold all the varieties, just the kinds. Now, uh, we heard this idea, this argument that stasis is not true and that scientists don't agree with stasis, but they do. This is, is Stephen Jay Gould. He says, stasis or non-change of most fossil species during their lengthy geological spans was tacitly acknowledged by all paleontologists, but almost never studied explicitly because prevailing theory treated stasis as uninteresting non-evidence of non-evolution. So I could provide lots more about that, but the simple fact is stasis is a fact for the geologic column. The vast majority of eminent scientists acknowledge it. This is Stephen Austin, a creationist geologist, and he discovered something profound and that uh, uniformitarianist scientists are now having to acknowledge is a science fact. Along the bottom of the Grand Canyon, there is a single strata that spans the entire 250 plus miles length of the entire geologic column at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. It's filled with a billion nautiloids. Many hundreds of thousands of them are in the upright position. And, 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 and this verifies that that entire geologic column in which we find the Noahic, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Grand Canyon was created by rapidly moving water, else this could not be true. It's impossible. That takes the entire geologic column argument of the uniformitarianist and throws it in the garbage because Todd. of this one layer alone. Todd. All right. Emoji. All right. Um, so uh, in regards to stasis, um, what I was trying to say is that no scientist or paleontologist, uh, paleontologist actually argues that stasis refutes evolution. Stasis is real, yes. Uh, lineage, lineage, lineages remain stable, morphologically stable. That's why we have bacteria today and other, you know, fish today, we, even though we evolved from fish. Um, yeah, because stasis is real, but it doesn't refute evolution. All it means is that some lineages remain stable, others change. Um, as uh, Standing for Truth said, that we don't see the major innovations and so on. Um, remember, evolution is a process, and processes take time. Um, for example, if a, a cake, for example, takes an hour to bake, don't expect me to bake it in five minutes. Then you're no longer asking for to bake a cake. You're asking for something else. So um, if you're asking for evidence of evolution that you know, evolution would not permit, then you're not asking for evidence of evolution. You're asking for evidence of something else. All right? Um, but again, uh, let me see. Uh, you said that you see uh, marine fossils on top high places. Um, the Earth actually churns and moves. Uh, it, it, it does that plate tectonics, so the sea floor can rise up and so on. Uh, note that on any mountain where you find marine fossils, you never find marine fossils that appeared after the mountain formed in, with respect to evolution. So it would, uh, if a mountain is 100 million years old, then there would be no fossils um, later than that on the mountain. Uh, so they would, you know, they would, again, you would not find no uh, whales or so on on the mountain. Uh, whales are a modern species. Um, what else? Ah, the, the cool crust. Uh, you brought up the cool crust. Um, I remember, I, I was asking you, how long does it take for the crust to change in temperature by a certain degree? Um, uh, actually, it actually takes millions of years for it to change, um, like for anywhere between 100 degrees and 400 degrees Celsius, according to how deep it is and what, you know, the, the, the makeup of it. So um, 
what I would ask is what's the difference in temperature between the mantle and the, the cold crust you're talking about, and let's calculate how long it would take to reach the temperature it's currently at. Uh, that time? Yes, that was time. Okay. Good. Snake, when you were ready. All right. Um, so we still don't have any explanation of how a flood sorts things by area or species or by density. I mean, how do the... How do the layers, the rock layers, repeat by type? Uh, we have repeating limestone layers. Water cannot do this. Water can only sort by density in a single event. Uh, and so, and we've actually done experiments like this. Like Kent Hoven has done this experiment himself, and the layers do not repeat by type. They all sell once by density. Um, and as well, why did all the whales survive but not marine reptiles? Why did the whales survive but in the exact sequential order predicted by evolutionary change? Um, the, they responded, well, actually, they didn't respond to my argument about uh, small, small scale changes adding up to my, macro evolutions um, instead of actually responding to the argument, uh, why can't. Uh, loss of hair, shrinking of limbs, growing of uh, appendages. Why can't that add up in the whale lineage exactly as we see it in the fossil record? They just dem uh, dogmatically assert that it can't happen. No addressing of the argument there. Um, and as for polystrate fossils, they're never actually found spanning any strata. They just span layers within the strata, um, basically just mud layers quickly uh, rapidly deposited over each other. Um, so that's actually several flooding rounds, not one. Um, and uh, Neth mentioned something uh, about uh, the the Barrowmans uh, spreading rapidly from the Ark. Uh, all of that evolution would have had to occur in just 4,000 years. So you're already hitting rapid changes in microevolution. So I'd really like to know how hydrologic sorting works and how why those changes that I specifically list, why they can't add up in a mammal. They are all small scale microevolutionary within kind changes that we see in the fossil record in a dated sequence. Why can't that happen? Uh, how much time do I have? 10 seconds, go ahead. All right, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. All right, we are two more rounds now. We have to go and then we're gonna move on to the discussion portion. So standing for truth, we're ready to go. So these evolutionists must not be uh, listening. Me and Neff both answered their questions by burial, by habitats, ecosystem, intelligence, mobility, body density. It's a combination of all of these. They want to attack just one, but then they want to ignore all the other um, mountain of, of evidence. Did the ocean waters at, at some time in the past flood over, over the continents in, in, in regards to what emotionally stunted Emoticon looks to here as a rescue device? The continents are made up of rocks that are that are less dense than both the ocean floor, the ocean floor rocks and the mantle rocks beneath the continents. And at the end of the day, the amount of times that the, the, the waters would have to rise and fall, rise and fall, it's, it's just not realistic. The evidence falls in line with a biblical base model. Uh, I still haven't seen any actual predictions. I've given a prediction based on the flood geology model. The fact that we have cold slabs of rock, it is confirmation of flood geology and, and not old age geology. Emotionally uh, here asks uh, questions regarding it. He, he questions, but he's not making actual predictions. This is a prediction by creationist geologists. Another amazing prediction too. Let's go on to more and more. That's what this is all about. They're ignoring loads and loads of evidence. Another amazing prediction that has actually been confirmed again in this model of, of say catastrophic plate tectonics is rapid magnetic reversals. The earth's magnetic field draws our compass needle towards the north. But sometimes in Earth's history, it draws it towards the south. Old age geologists believe that this has been happening for hundreds of millions of years and would have taken thousands of years to occur. It, it was old Earth geologists that, that found confirming evidence of rapid magnetic reversals. And these are actually required for Noah's flood, of course. They were taking a look at lava flows that would only take a, a couple of weeks in order to form. They took measurements of, of the skin of the lava is what they did to see the magnetic orientation. Now, they were expecting to see almost no change as they went deeper into the hot lava where the 
interior should shift only slightly. Instead, what they actually found was the outside skin pointed north and the inside pointed south. So we have confirmation evidence from lava flows that the switch of, of magnetic field has to happen rapidly, which is exactly what flood geologists expected. Right. Prediction after prediction. Where are their predictions? And they're not addressing any of the, any of the arguments. It's just imagination, ideas, and beliefs. Go ahead, Neff. Okay, I'd, I'd like to point out that Taylor said earlier the sediments don't sort by density. Uh, we just heard him on the mic a moment ago saying it does. Uh, this is what happens with uniformitarianists when you provide evidence. They can't refute it. They have to agree with it. And then they, of course, realize what they've done and deny it again. Uh, if you play back this hangout, you'll hear that Taylor earlier said sedimentary materials do not sort by density. And on his, in his last speak, uh, speak, he said they do. Now, what we find in the geologic column is un unarguable evidence that sedimentary strata are created by rapidly moving water. What you're looking now at now is an unconformity that can only be explained by rapidly moving water. The sedimentary strata at the bottom, at the lower, the lower ones, were laid down by rapidly moving water, and the boundary between them and the angular unconformity that you see right there was sheared them off by rapidly moving water and laid down new ones at a different angle. The only way this is possible is if those what are called rock layers there, the strata, were soft sedimentary materials not even yet concreted in the stone when the materials above them sheared them flat by a rapidly moving sheet of water and laid down new ones. Solid rock will not erode rap, uh, rap, uh, uh, over any amount of time to such a, a, a incredibly fine boundary like that. It, it erodes roughly. This is proof of the Noahic flood right before your eyes. This is a folded mountain, proof of the Noahic flood. Rock doesn't bend, it breaks. Unless it's 10 to 20 miles deep in the earth where the temperature is 500 centigrade or higher, it will not bend, it will shatter. This mountain and the miles and miles of sedimentary strata that the mountain itself is made of goes on outside it, left and right, are, were pushed up out of the earth during the flood of Noah, and that's why the mountain is deformed like that. These two explain the flood of Noah is a geologic fact. Rock does not bend. Rock does not bend. Rock does not bend. That God. concludes my time. All right. You must have it. You are up. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Sonic for Truth wanted some predictions. Um, okay, then um, I predict that you would not find uh, bony fish, sharks in the Cambrian. You would not find any marine tetrapod appearing before uh, tetrapods in the Devonian, so no tet uh, marine tetrapods would be there. Um, you would not find any marine mammal before the origin of mammals whenever they emerge. So no. Um, I won't find any marine reptiles before the origin of reptiles. That's some predictions there for you. Um, what else? Um, uh, flowing plants and so on, you, you won't find them um, in the Cambrian. They, they, they didn't exist that time. Um, yeah, so that's, that's some predictions there for you. Um, what else did we have to go over here? Um, well, yeah, again, the, the cold crust, um, we need to know just saying that something is cold, relatively cold, is that's a non-argument. Uh, we have to know how long it takes and so on and so on. So that's why I was asking you in the comment section how long it takes. Um, I don't expect you to answer it now. We can discuss that later when we could, you know, cite sources. Um, so we know how long it takes to, to change in temperature, and then we can calculate how long it must have taken to reach the current temperature it is. So we need to know the current temperature and, you know, how long it takes to reach that temperature. Um, what else do we have to talk about? Um, in regards to the flood, I, I um, I, I see Neff talk about the, the, the raindrops, they are fossilized raindrops. Um, must have missed them, I don't know, but I can get them for you, Neff. Uh, they are fossilized egg nests. That, that, that's that's the thing that really got me since uh, that's the first thing I, I couldn't understand. How does an egg nest, it, like a fully formed nest with eggs in it? Preserve in a flood. I mean, and it's sandwiched between layers that were laid down by the same flood. Fifteen seconds. That is, yeah, that is something that always bothered me since uh, inception or uh, well, whatever of learning about flood geology. It's not something we deal with in the Caribbean. It's an American thing, actually. Yeah, that's it. All right, perfect time.
All right, Snake, whenever you're ready. All right, so uh, whatever Nephew was on about, um, I was saying that the they don't sort by dent. The waters don't sort by density the way you describe. Uh, they do sort by density, but once they don't repeat the layers. Do you? I hope you understand this. I know you'll deliberately try to misunderstand it if you can. Um, and you think rock layers shear off uh, other rocks, but you think that they also explode when they contact each other, and that's how mountains are made. So I'm still seeing no actual consistent theory of how this works. Um, for his rocks don't bend spiel, they do bend. We've witnessed this in real time under high heat and high stress. There are equations for this. The geologists have studied this. They've predicted this. They can calculate it. Uh, they, Jet Neff loves to quote the geologists and say geology this, geology that, and they disagree with him, and they do, and the, the entirety of his theory. Um, let's see, microbes are found at the bottom of the geologic column. Supposedly, the denser items got put at the bottom, but we see the lightest of all organisms at the bottom, and we see repeating rock layers, which is not possible by flood light, by water sorting. Um, we see extremely dense animals at the top, even though the entire flood would have mixed everything homogeneously, but we actually see a pattern of things um, going towards modern forms. So I'm must be arguing that they were evolving as they were swimming out of the flood. Uh, that would be in line with your extremely fast evolution model of getting 10 billion species in just 4,000 years off of the ark. Um, and I'd like to touch also on uh, the ridiculousness of... 15 of the fact. Uh, I'll just point out that genetic entropy ruins all of this uh, for you, especially the Garden of Eden, so I'll touch on that next time. All right. We are last round. Roundabout, standing for truth. You are ready to go, and this is your last part before we move on to the discussion. Okay, uh, created heterozygosity model makes predictions, testable predictions. Uh, that explains uh, young Earth creation speciation. I'll uh, talk to Snake about that in our discussion portion. Um, at the end of the day, those predictions um, made by emotion there, they're not actual predictions because it's based on misunderstandings of, of our model. It's, it, all these arguments that he's using is, is a straight misunderstanding. We we looked at burial by ecosystems and habitats. We can see based on Genesis, this is what they don't see. They look to today and expect that's what it was in the past. The land of Eden, we are told, a river flows out of Eden. And we know rivers flow downhill. And so Eden was obviously at a higher elevation. We know certain animals, such as, let, let's say, certain dinosaurs would have lived in, in different lowland areas. And so various animals of various ecosystems and habitats were obviously separated from man and other forms of life after the flood after the uh, the disruption of, of the continents in, in the catastrophic processes the habitats and ecosystems of today would have been different than in the pre-flood world because just like today different creatures and and different animals live in different habitats in the pre-flood world, we see certain fossils that are usually buried together and say dinosaur fossils, they're usually buried with gymnosperms, whereas mammal fossils are usually buried with things such as what? Flowering plants. That indicates clearly two different ecosystems. We can speculate based on what we know about Genesis and the fact that the land of Eden, a river flows out of, out of Eden. This suggests higher elevations, different elevations. So dinosaurs, for example, although lived at the same time of man, did not necessarily live in the same areas or habitats. This is obvious. Therefore, his predictions, his arguments are based on a straw man understanding. Anytime these, both these evolutionists talk about evolution, it's, it's wishful thinking, it's storytelling, it's imagination, it's ideas and, and beliefs. There's no actual empirical evidence. Now, at the end of the day, these animals in different ecosystems and habitats, they were overcome by the flood at different times during the advancing of the waters that explains why we don't find them buried together so burial by ecosystems different communities habitats explains the data perfectly there is so much evidence that the earth was once underwater they're ignoring all the the marine fossils on mountains and in landlocked areas that are actually far from the sea 
fossils of animals giving birth, fish being eaten. Everything we see suggests sudden and rapid burial. Was that time, Matt? Yes. Yeah, it's up. Okay, thanks. Neff, you are up. Okay. So um, what we heard from uh, Taylor just a moment ago is the rock will bend. Uh, but uniformitarianist scientists acknowledge that rock will not bend unless it's subjected to at least 500 degrees centigrade. And to get there, you have to be 10 to 20 miles down inside the earth. So the only way for a mountain to be folded is if it's 10 to 20 miles, the material, 10 to 20 miles down inside the earth, or it will not bend. A rock will not bend at normal temperatures. At anywhere near the temperature of the surface of the earth, it will simply break. Uh, if Taylor is ignorant of this, then he should investigate because there is no geologist in the world that doesn't agree with that. Now, there's a whole argument behind that. How do you get materials that make a mountain and folded strata 10 to 20 miles down to become a mountain? Uh, I could debate that with you. It would take an hour. You won't see that. It's not geologically possible. So what we've provided is, uh, uh, Standing for Truth and myself have provided empirical scientific evidence of the Noahic flood, the fossil, the existence of a fossil record, the billions of rapidly buried creatures buried in situ in their environments where they lived or by mobility, in, in sedimentary strata that are only produced by rapidly moving water, which have clear distinct boundaries between each other without gradation, which cannot occur over uniformitarian time. Impossible. Impossible. And uh, which have uh, particle size distribution. These features rapidly uh, are of particle size distribution, clear distinct boundaries, causing unconformities, parabolic and, un, uh, and uh, recumbent folds, can only be produced by moving water. They are a prominent feature of the entire geologic column in which we are sitting upon, an average of 1,800 meters. In some places, it's miles deep. So the entire geologic column of the Earth was produced, obviously, rapidly. The geologic evidence for this is beyond overwhelming. It is impossible for uniformitarianism to explain the geologic column. It happened rapidly. Thus, we have empirical evidence of the Noahic flood. And oh, that's perfect. Emoji. Stunted. Me. Oh, um, just want to know how many rounds, uh, how many rounds left? Don't start on it. This is the final one. And then we move into oh, the... Okay, so um, you can start it now. Yeah. Um, right standing, uh, you, t you talked about different ecosystems and um, the Garden of Eden being, um, you know, at an elevation and so on. I agree with you. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with, with you here. Um, what I'm saying is that's why I'm using marine mammals, uh, marine tetrapods, marine things, because I know, according to you, they were buried first. So um, it, it should follow that, you know, we should expect at least some whales either with or buried before some dinosaurs. We don't find that. We don't find manatees either, nor seals, and for good reason. They didn't. They weren't. They didn't exist as yet. All right. Um, so I predict that you won't find that. So it, it's a prediction that should follow from uh, creationism. They, I don't know if they make it, but it, it should logically follow. Uh, you don't find any whales around there. That they, you know. Um, secondly, it's not necessarily where these organisms live. Remember. These organisms would have died as well, and their carcasses would have sunk to the sea floor. So you should expect at least some fish, bony fish in the Cambrian, you know, some fish died and their carcasses um, went down to the sea floor. Uh, unless you want to argue all of them were devoured or whatever, I don't know. Um, what else do we discuss? Um, again, those eggs, I, I, I don't know about the eggs, but um, I, I, I didn't know if you discussed the eggs. I kind of uh, went out for like 30 seconds of this speech. Um, yeah, so those those eggs are something that, that haunts me when it comes to uh, flood geology. Um, what else when it comes to... Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't really have much to say. Uh, oh, yeah, humans. Um, what, what did, what did pre-flood humans do? Uh, I remember Matt was speaking about um, Neanderthals and so on. Um, pre-flood uh, pre man may have looked something like that. I, I don't know. Oh, why we don't find any pre-flood man or any pre-flood -pre man structures? Did they build structures and so on? They seem to be technologically advanced enough to build a, um, a boat, uh, an ark. So what structures did they build and why weren't they preserved? I mean, they are preserved footprints. Why we don't get any preserved structures, uh, man-made structures 
uh, pre-flood mana structures, uh, any of them. Yeah, that's it. All right, all right. Nate, when you were ready. Okay, um, still no response on the accumulation of those small-scale uh, changes predicted by evolution and found in perfect order in the fossil record, in places predicted by the dating science. Um, burial by ecosystem and habitat would predict that the Precambrian animals would be found in the same layers as all shallow water life, including amphibians um, and all everything that lives on the shores today. Uh, this is not seen. Instead, they're organized in a sequence of gradual changes toward modern forms. Um, there is a Permian Reef in Texas. Uh, this supposed shallow water layer, we've reefs occur in shallow water layer, shallow waters. Um, and so this would uh, supposedly be in the shallow water layers with all the other Precambrian stuff. Um, but instead, this occurs in much higher layers characterized by terrestrial fossils, like the Dimetrodon. According to their model, this reef um, would have had to have been moved. Uh, this 150-mile reef would have had to have been removed undisturbed, uncracked, um, all the way into the middle of Texas, somehow by a bunch of water. Um, this is pretty ridiculous. Uh, geologists clearly state that the Noahic flood is impossible. Uh, you're misrepresenting the science as usual. Um, it was obviously proven to happen over a long geologic time scale. And this is uh, confirmed by radiometric data. Um, there, we know the exact rate of radiometric decay and it never changes. And we know the initial amounts based on several different methods, which I could explain again for Nephilim if he doesn't still doesn't understand that. Um, as for marine fossils in mountains, um, I don't understand this. This reveals a basic misunderstanding of geology how mountains are formed by the uh, crushing of tectonic plates <laughs> against each other. 15 seconds. Excuse you. Um, let's see. Yeah, they just push against each other, and so that is how lower lakes get um, brought up. Um, and if without death in the garden, this, uh, this is just tacked on at the end a little bit, but uh, without death in the garden, you couldn't even have life. You couldn't grow anything. Uh, everything would be teeming with slime and bacteria. Um, you couldn't have new babies without death. You couldn't digest plants without death. Um, their whole model is a fairy tale, and that's why nothing makes sense. Time. All right. We're jumping into the discussion portion right now. So, Stunted Emojicon and Neff. I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes. And... Uh, we are going to jump right into this. So when you guys are ready, I will start the timer. And whoever wants to begin, go right ahead. Okay, so it's just me and him for 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. Well, I, firstly, I'll just point out that Taylor uh, just acknowledged that the whole geologic column, the flood of Noah thing, is religious for him. He's tying it to the, to the Garden of Eden and says, uh, uh, you know, that... Uh, Precambrian fossils mm -hmm. found throughout the geologic column. Uh, that's absurd. Uh, if you have sediments, thick sediments moving across the earth uh, and the onset of the Noahic flood, there's no reason for us to believe that those creatures wouldn't be buried in situ, but be churned up and then found throughout the rest of the sediments as they built up, going upward throughout the geologic column. Taylor's ideas are absolutely bizarre. Would but you like, like to just do it all together? Throw them in? Oh. Well, do we all want to discuss together, or do you want to do? Well, that might become chaotic. It might be good if we stuck to what we got going. Well, yeah, we can like so, standing uh, for emoticon, I would ask you um, if 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 uh, uniformitarianism is true and the geologic uh, flood of Noah is not true, can you explain to me a scientific geologic process that's capable of building up the continents vertically that creates strata with clear, distinct boundaries between them? Whereas the boundary can be seen so fine that it's often paper thin between one strata and another and another and another and another going upward, 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 upward for in some places six miles 
and, and on an average 1,800 meters deep. How can uniformitarianism explain the geologic column, the strata with clear distinct boundaries, instead of gradiating from one material into another? Can you explain that to me? Uh, right. Um, so the, 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 the gradation you're talking about would actually be expected under uh, flood. Uh, if you witness our flood deposits things, it would actually have a gradient that would expect under the flood. Um, under a uniformitarian model, uh, what happens is the, the layers would be laid down, they would either solidify or whatever, and then it may be eroded somewhat, and then new um, layers are, are put on top of it. So you have this distinction between the layers. Um, I, I don't see how that can happen, th that kind of distinction can happen in a flood where uh, things are churning and moving. You know, in a uh, single how can rapidly moving water create gradation if it's depositing materials on top of other materials? How does uh, gradation requires time? For for you know, let me explain why. Uh, one material becomes less available to the environment in that location over time, and another one becomes more available over time. But that's not what we see in the geologic column. These millions of strata going vertically, we see that one material comes to an abrupt end, just bam, stops. And then another material it directly above it, and the difference sometimes in space between them is less than a millimeter. Sometimes it's just a few millimeters. That's not gradation. That's not the one material uh, blending into another. The, the, your, the blending, the, ge the gradation that you speak of, it's not present throughout the geologic column. It's one material ends, bam, abruptly another material begins. That would require time. Otherwise, you're believing that for some reason or, um, uh, it, it happened quadrillions of times that one material stopped being available for deposition in a given location and another one instantly became available for deposition in that location. Why would that be geologically plausible if millions upon millions upon millions of rain events, for example, over millions of years is what built that strata? Did you understand the question? Do I need to make it simpler? If those materials were laid down by millions and millions of rain events that slowly moved materials, why would some, for some reason that fast, one material stop being available for deposition and another type of material become available for deposition in a flash if, you, if those strata were formed over millions of years? It's a tough question, I know. There really is no suitable answer from your camp. It can't be answered by your camp, but I would be interested in hearing you try. Okay, um, so well, got a chance. Um, as I was saying, um, I would I would need to get some citations and so on as to how the the process actually works. Um, off my head, I'm not going to give you anything um, substantial on it, uh, um, obviously. But um, as I said, you would have the deposition, and then um, you may have solidification and so on. Remember that the earth, the, the earth actually churns and moves. Um, you'd have um, where, where seas and so on would cover the land and then they would, would go back and then it would do the same thing again and so on. That's how um, it, it happens. Um, but again, I, I don't see how that happens during a flood, uh, like a single flood event. It's actually harder to believe that happens during a single depositional event. Uh, usually when you see that happens, um, the particles are sorted by density and size and so on. And it does meld together uh, um, because again, the, the flood is churning. Remember the, the a single flood event is churning all these materials. I'm not sure as to how they sort it in that way. I would love to see an experiment, at least on a large scale, not a little thing Kent uses, okay. uh, an experiment where we see at least, you know, some sort of a sorting like that. Well, this has been done many, many times. I can show you dozens upon dozens of fluke experiments. Maybe you're not informed. Maybe you're not aware of it. But there have been many, many hydrologists and uh, geology perform uh, experiments in in uh, in uh, sedimentology that demonstrate exactly that very thing. What you're looking at is a, just one of dozens and dozens of experiments that have been performed over the last oh, 40 or 50 years. And this is exactly what they perform, pr produce. Rapidly moving water 
with, which is littered with various materials mixed up in them, sorts them by grain size and density to create strata right before the scientist's eyes in fluke experiments. Numerous experiments like this, numerous experiments are performed. These, these experiments are all published in the science journals. And this is exactly what it's observed to take place when rapidly moving water is given a mix, a, a, a homogeneous mix of different materials. It automatically sorts them by particle size and grain, a grain size, that is, and by, by density to produce what you see on the screen. Strata, right before the scientist's eyes in real time, on the fly, it takes minutes sometimes seconds you can actually see you can actually see the ang the angular conformity produced right there let me show you an angular conformity being produced on the fly right there you see these horizontal these angular lines this is an angular conformity on small scale produced with horizontal strata produced right above it in real time in a laboratory on top of other materials so I don't know where you're getting your ideas, but I'm not sure that science, because science shows that uh, rapidly moving water creates particle size distribution, lamina, and uh, un unconformities on the fly in seconds. It Ooh. doesn't take millions of years. Where do you get the idea that there millions of years are necessary for this stuff to form? Because this is a feature of the entire geologic column going all the way down to Cambrian. Okay. All right. So I got a chance to speak here. Um, the, the 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 fossil uh, the the layers in the in the geologic column, especially in the Grand Canyon, where you can see a lot of them, uh, they are not arranged by any kind of grain size or anything that you'd expect from a single depositional event. Um, again, I'm not sure the dynamics. Of, don't interrupt me, Neff. Don't do that. The strata are formed um, or organized by grain size. Do that. Don't moderate that guy for me, please. Go ahead. Right. So, um, as I was saying, in in the in the the geo, um, oh, now you make the last one. I'm saying. The Grand Canyon, the the rocks are not assorted by grain size or anything. You would see uh, sand layers at the, at the bottom, and then you would see other types of rocks, and then you'd see like sand again. That's just not true. Um, the entire geologic column is made that in way. In the at the bottom, uh, for example, at the the um, is it the super group or something? There, you would see um, at the bottom, uh, dead at the bottom, you would see there are layers that were lifted at an angle and then cut off, right? Thirty seconds um, horizontally. Um, again, okay. Uh, again, I'd like well, to know what kind of flood dynamic can well, actually well, be. I, I think you're uninformed about the geologic column because geologists acknowledge unif universally that the entire throughout the entire geologic column of the earth the strata in the earth uh, in general in general not every strata but in general display particle size distribution throughout the entire geologic column i don't know where you're getting your science from but it's not the journals go ahead stunted finish 10 seconds oh well uh, uh Def, we'd have to um, I'll get my citations. Um, we'd, we would do the just just the um, Grand Canyon alone, and um, I think we can do a discussion on that maybe in the next two weeks. I'll have to do some heavy reading. Yeah, I'm no geologist, so I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, I think you need to do some reading, a lot of it. All right, well, all right, you guys can wrap it up in your closing coming up, but uh, we're going to jump right into standing up truth and snake, and uh, I will start the time when the first words are spoken 10 minutes go ahead guys I, I definitely want to talk about speciation in the created heterozygosity hypothesis one thing did jump out at me that that snake said at the end where he accused Neff and i of not understanding simple uh geology so as he knows yes there are several different ways that you know mountains can form uh one of them as as he as, as you stated snake was you know many mountains are actually formed a result of earth's tectonic plates smashing together right and as we know the earth's crust is made up of uh, many multiple tectonic plates that still move today no one's disagreeing with that and, and all that's as a result of geologic activity which is below the surface so why do you think just stating that fact 
I think I went a little more, you know, detailed in regards to it, proves your uniformitarian pseudoscientific belief and um, understanding of, of, of the mountain ranges we see and, and everything we see in geology, Snake. Uh, I don't think that that proves it just because we know how mountains are formed, but the order of fossils and the layers is pretty good evidence. Um, well, I mean, we're talking about uh, created heterozygosity. What do I do? We'll get to that. I just want to I want to press you on this because if we take a, a specific case, for example, because you're the one that brought it up and accused us of not understanding geology because I was looking to the catastrophic plate tectonics model, continental sprint, you would look to continental drift. But we're going to need meters per second continental sprint to explain what we see. For example, a specific case, the Appalachian Mountains on the northeastern seaboard of North America, the uniformitarian is it, the uniformitarians believe that it took about 100 million years to completely form before plates then shifted into a different direction. But let me ask you, at the current rate of movement, which I believe is about four inches or 10 centimeters per year, the force and energy of, of the collision, let's say if we look at the Indian, Australian or the Eurasian plates, um, so let's say the collision between those two plates, could they have been sufficient to push up the Himalayas? The pressure how, between them? Yeah. How, how can how can only four in, if it's four inches per year? Okay, at, at the current rate of, of movement. Say, if we're looking at the force and energy required between the Indian, Australian, and you how heavy a continent of rock is, right? And if it's moving at four inches per year, that's a metric F ton of energy if you... <laughs> no, no, it, it's it's very questionable for you to say that at, with, with that force and energy, that they could actually push up the Himalayas. It's like two cars colliding. If, if they're colliding or traveling at, at, at such a, a low speed, because if, if we look at the, the plate movements, if they're measured you know, as feet per second, like two cars each traveling at 62 miles per hour, that would be 100 kilometers an hour, the resulting catastrophic collision would have rapidly buckled rock strata to push up those those high mountains. But your uniformitarian <laughs> processes at only four inches per year can't push up the Himalayas. It's impossible. They can and they do, and the equations support it, and all the well, your evidence that they do. Here's your uh, evidence that they do. Does geology support old Earth or young Earth? No, it, 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 don't divert. Don't divert. You're the one who brought up. You, know the you guys didn't right, address no. my um, predictions that that I provided. Tell yeah, me, you don't have any. four inches per year, that type of force and energy could push up the Himalayas. Are you just gonna? Are you just gonna say, well, the geologists can explain it? How how right. is it possible? How is it possible? Because you have an entire continent full of rock moving at that speed. At only four inches per year, that type of force. Yeah, you don't understand momentum. Bring up the him. No, you're the one who doesn't understand it because you've already been pressed by Jeremy on this, and your answers weren't. So yeah, a continent moving at that speed is still a lot of energy. Oh, no, no. You need Rock, three yes. meters per second. It's enough to move. A continent is moving. That's enough energy to move a continent. Next. It's a pseudo scientific belief to say that with no app actual evidence when we've actually made a prediction based on continental sprint and it's come true so at the end of the day you can look to that snake but it's not actually because when we look at the geology of the earth present processes as you're proving here can't actually explain what we see because rather what we see points to catastrophic processes in the past that's confirmation of noah's flood that's the title of yeah, the debate well, you the just, the 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 just debunked catastrophism a long time ago so how is uh how are all these living things supposed to proliferate that quickly if evolution is false? Um, okay. if, if we can proliferate things, how come you can't answer my question about uh, the small scale uh, microevolutions adding up? Well, we act, well, you, your complaint, well, first we're, we're just. Why gonna, isn't that possible? First, we're going to acknowledge that you can your question. that question since it's actually meters per second movement of, of the plates that could actually explain the geology, the mountains that we actually see. Catastrophic plate tectonics, not. Continental drift. 
that's pseudoscience. Now, created heterozygosity hypothesis, if we actually have these heterozygous ancestors, right, as you know, as I've explained before, if God created the original created kinds, Adam and Eve, with pre-existing functional DNA differences, an almost limitless variety of combinations of chromosomes, genes, and traits are possible. We've made predictions, okay? These predictions are coming true. The vast, vast majority of our genome is Functional, we don't need mutations to actually explain the changes, the micro changes as you talk about. Yet they do. Yeah, it's a recombination and gene conversion. And that's going to provide many new varieties of combination of traits quickly, since as I've said, the difference is already built in all the time. Well, what do you have against that model? Because that's what we see. We see a pre existing functional DNA differences. You guys look to. It really, except that it's not observed. Um, and even assuming that. The fossil transitions that we see in the fossil record are okay. So now you're jumping to, to, to fossil so transitions. Why, why, why are you jumping around? Okay, so first, let's acknowledge you failed on, on the catastrophic plate tectonics. Now yeah. you failed to give an objection to created heterozygosity hypothesis. Now you just want to go to transitional forms. You want to be 0 for 3 or you want to be 1 for 2? So instead of just talking over me, maybe you can let me get out a few sentences. Oh, because I don't want you jumping around from topic to topic. We've talked about uh, catastrophic plate tectonics uh, in regards to split. moderation, so I can speak. So um, the problem with so speed within that model of created heterozygosity, okay. what's so your all the evolution that, that we see? It's transitional. Uh, oh my gosh! Um, no, go so, ahead. Tell me your objection to everything I just said. Go. Take as much time as you need. I. Where were we? Um, Within the model of created heterozygosity, the same fossil transitions that we see in the fossil record are still possible, such as the exact instance with whales that I gave. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Your objection was how can we get so many varieties of species after the flood? I've given you an answer based on created heterozygosity hypothesis. Now you're going to supposed whale transitionals. What is your objection to what I just said and my answer to your objection in regards to speciation post-flood? Adam and Eve were created with pre-existing functional DNA differences. We can see this because the majority of our genome is functional. Okay, so with amazing design and functional heterozygosity, even at a tiny fraction of their nucleotide snake, through the processes of gene conversion and recombination, an essentially unlimited range of useful diversity would be produced. What is your objection to that? I, I've already stated that I don't really have an objection to that other than it's absurd. Okay, so that we okay, see, I can't even get a sentence out, man. Well, because that was your argument. Hold on. So you just admitted Hold on. that I have an answer to Hold it. Hold on. Right? I'm going to talk to you if, you if you don't let me talk. So within that model of having uh, pre-created heterozygosity, you can still get all of the fossil transitions, such as the one that you won't answer. What is your objection to the ad addition of these small-scale transitions in the same population? Because we don't actually see that. So, for example, you seem to be confusing two things, okay? Adaptation to environments and I, evolution oh, of high. Just a second. I'm answering your question. Created heterozygosity predicts oh, change, well. adaptation. But at the end of the day, it doesn't take a genius to see that these are different issues because the adaptation we look to, the change we look to, that can be accomplished by loss of information. That's exactly what we see. Why are those higher life form? always requires a large increase in net information. We don't see that. We see the degradation. Can you point to me, point me to a beneficial mutation that actually adds new novel information as we're, as compared to degrades information? Because that's what you're going to need to take your fish to fishermen. Go ahead. Yep. Any mutation that creates a new protein, that's new information. And we've been over this over and over and over. No, yeah, we've uh, been over this over and over. Look changing instructions. We see no large scale. What's your benef What's your best beneficial mutation that you can point to that actually over this. You're changing the subject so you don't have to answer. What is your objection to those small scale adaptations adding up in the same population? I've already given you the objection. No, you haven't given an objection to those specific ones. Why can't that happen theoretically? Theoretically, it can't happen because what do we see? We see change that is down. We see loss of information, degradation of information, the, the breakdown of functional systems. That's not going to take your, We've your observed all those changes. organism to a whale. 
Where's your genetic role? entropy? I don't want your ideas. Work. I don't want your beliefs. I want your actual genetic evidence. entropy debunks your entire flood model because of the population bottlenecks seen after the arc. Those populations would go extinct within 100 generations. We've run the numbers at those uh, population limits, and especially since inbreeding, because you only start with okay, a single pair, genetic entropy would take over. Okay, because that bottleneck was Very little heterozygosity would have been lost. Your model, your model, your your bottleneck that you look to is prolonged. That would actually lead to the inbreeding, and the that population would have been genetically compromised. What do we see? Low genetic diversity. Any two human beings on Earth are no more than 0.5% different. That proves we came from two people, Adam and Eve. You, my friend, you look to a bottleneck, and your bottleneck is what disproves your theory. How do you explain the fact that what we would observe is low genetic diversity? Go ahead. Actually, we recently diverged. I was muted. Sorry. That was at well after 10 minutes. Uh, we'll have to use that in the, uh, in the closing. Um, actually, yeah, we'll jump into the uh, – what is it? Three minutes, I believe. Closing for each person, and then awesome. who starts? Uh, uh, we'll go in reverse. Oh. It doesn't really matter though. Who feels like closing it up? Matter of fact, uh, let's tell the audience now. Does anybody here feel like doing an after show? And if so, tell the audience about it. I'd be up for that. So, Neff on your channel, then sounds like there'll be an after show. I could do it. I guess, yeah. Okay, all right, great. And um, whoever would like to start uh, with a closing, feel free or um, take it away, or I'll just pick one if nobody says anything. Well, I'm, I might as well start since the since I started the debate, I might as well, uh, and then we'll go me, Neff, and I guess the evolutionist. So um, at the end of the day, I think anybody can see here that their arguments, uh, for one, when they brought up evolution, it was nothing but beliefs, ideas, uh, imagination. They hope, they dream, they imagine that pine trees, whales, and, and apples were related through common ancestry in spite of the evidence that contradicts their, their belief. As you can see there, Snake, and we could destroy every single one of his arguments as we have. Um, he had no answer to how continental drift can lead to the geology we see. He just makes basic ge geology statements that we all know. But we've made the predictions. They ignored the predictions. Cold slabs, ra rapid magnetic reversals, all confirmation. What do we see when we look at when we look to the geology of the Earth? As I've pointed out and demonstrated in my discussion with uh, Snake, there present processes they can't in no way, shape, or form explain what we see. Everything points to catastrophic processes in the past. That's confirmation of of Noah's flood. Much geologic evidence, it suggests rapid plate tectonics. As you can see there, Snake's big argument that I actually saved for the discussion because I knew it would destroy him, was how, how do we see the speciation out of, from, the, from the different kinds of animals off of the ark post-flood? I showed him over and over again, created heterozygosity hypothesis, mixed predictions, confirmed predictions on mutation rates, DNA function, and he agreed. He has no objection to it, but yet he'll still keep going on and on about how this somehow, somehow debunks our model. No, no, no. The evolutionists, they have straw man understandings of our model. That's why Candor Man, who I debated a couple weeks ago, go watch that debate. The guy thinks bacteria actually disproves genetic entropy. At the end of the day, genetic entropy destroys Ponds come to people evolution and proves biblical creation. It is a double whammy. Global flood, honestly, with the vast and unique consequences involved in it, it easily explains everything we see. Coal, oil. Um, it's not due to millions of years. The Grand Canyon did not form in millions of years. It formed in weeks. Major mountain ranges, as, as I've shown in my discussion with Snake, did not form over hundreds of millions of years. Each formed in hours. And it makes predictions. So at the end of the day, all evidence points to a biblical creation model and Noah's global flood. How much time do I have, Matt? One minute. How much time have we been? Oh, we got five minutes. No. Um, so at, at the end of the day, we can even see this in, in a real-time example. For example, uh, we can look to M Mount St. Helens, rapidly formed sedimentary layers and canyons at, at Mount St. Helens. And these evolutionists, they – they don't understand. They can't see the scope and scale of the energy produced by the flood. It's absolutely amazing. The fountains of the great deep, 
as read in Genesis, they break open. Earth is fractured like an eggshell. The continents are moving vertically and horizontally. Tsunamis, they're driving floodwaters onto the continents. Geologic catastrophes, rain is unending. Like I said, we've made predictions. Um, evolution, we've destroyed every every argument there. They've ignored everything we see in regards to um, you know the fossils of animals giving birth. The eruption at Mount St. Helens, as, as I've stated, has demonstrated you know sedimentary layers, hundreds of feet thick. They're laid down in hours to days. Canyons are formed rapidly. Multiple fo fossilized forests, they're, they're formed as a result of a single volcanic eruption. And it even suggests how coal seams could be produced quickly. So uh, we've also seen recent discoveries of dinosaur soft tissue. We didn't even get to touch on that. In association with intact biomolecules, they suggest that dinosaurs, they, they haven't been extinct for millions and millions of years, but only thousands of years. If you want to see uh, what the evolutionist's best rebuttal would be, go check my debate with RJ Downard. I destroyed him on dinosaur soft tissues. They don't have any arguments other than rescue devices, imagination, ideas, and beliefs. I conclude my statement. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Neff, you are up. No. Okay, my turn. Okay, yeah. So, uh, right. Okay, so uh, we heard uh, crazy ideas about geology, about lamination and stratification. This is a, a picture of one of uh, numerous studies in lamination and stratification in the journals. Many of them exist. This is what it makes right there. Now, this is what we see in the earth right there. The same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Look at each of these strata. The, the remarkable uh, example you're seeing on the screen right now is numerous different types of materials deposited rapidly by moving water right upon each other. That's exactly what we see in the journals published by uh, sedimentologists. That's what we see. That's what we see in the earth. It's the same thing. So when they do this in the lab and it forms in minutes or seconds right before their eyes, and then we see this in the earth, we know that this is what caused this. It's the same process. This is the scientific evidence that uniformitarians have to refuse to accept. Look at the, uh, it, the astonishing clarity of the boundary between these strata. It is mind-bendingly fine. Look at that. It's astonishing how fine the boundary between these strata are. That's because it, they were created by rapidly moving water. And that is a general feature of the entire geologic column. What this means, unfortunately, for the uniformitarianists, look at this one right here. This was the mind-bending one right there. Look at this. Wow. Talking about a fine boundary between strata, look at that right there. One material deposited the ends wrap abruptly, and above it immediately is an entirely different material that cannot happen over vast ages of time. It is scientifically impossible. If the geologic column, the strata of the geologic column were produced over vast ages of time. 30 seconds. There, there is no geologic time to be found in the geologic column. It was produced by a one year watery event, cataclysmic event produced caused by the Noahic flood. Rapidly moving water produces this feature. How do we know? There it is in the science journals. And this is what we see in the earth. Right there. Right there. Because that's a science fact. Time. All right. Stunted, you are up. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I can start now. Can you hear me good, by the way? What? What? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, clear. 
Oh, wonderful. Um, so uh, the uh, standing on the uh, the cold crust uh, argument or prediction, um, just saying cold crust, uh, we predicted cold crust, um, and we found cold crust isn't an argument. Uh, it's, that's a non-argument. We need to know how long it takes for the crust to um, change in temperature and so on and so on and so on. And then we have an argument. Um, again, it actually takes millions of years to change um, a certain amount of degrees. So we can check the relative um, difference between the uh, between the, um, the the crust and the mantle. So you can know, well, okay, if it's this, this amount of you know, degrees, we know it, it took this amount of time to get that temperature. Uh, yeah, so we need, we need to do that. Uh, we need some citations for that. Um, uh, built in heterozygosity. Um, that has to do a lot with kinds. And um, although I know what a kind is, a kind is a group of organisms related to each other, but unrelated to everything else. Uh, that's not, I don't have a problem with the definition of a kind, is how they discern what a kind is. Um, the, the closest that I've ever seen was Todd Wood, uh, but he uses morphological continuity not genetics to, um, to establish what a kind is. Um, some creation would, 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 would I know. Uh, wait, you are, we, lost, we lost you. So get ready to repeat what you just said. I'll stop the time. Family, no one okay. accepts that. No creation accepts that. Uh, family Can you hear me? Oh, could you hear me? You cut out for probably 15 seconds there. You might have to back that oh, up. Oh, no. Um, okay, so um, I was talking about built-in heterozygosity. Is it based on kinds? Um, I don't know how much organisms can fit within a kind or how they determine that. Or, um, how is a, a can distinguish within itself and differentiate it from unrelated things? Um, usually creationists use the family level as a, a demarcation, but, but again, taxonomy doesn't have anything to do with relatedness, just taxonomy. Um, so, they use, again, family, uh, but for example, corn and bamboo is in the same family. No creations except that corn and bamboo is related, or uh, a cucumber and a bitter melon or a watermelon and so on. They're in the same family. They don't accept that. Apes are in the same family with, with, with humans. They don't accept that as well. So I don't know what exactly is a kind and how they determine that, that heterozygosity thing. Um, I guess they would have to show where phylogeny breaks down, um, um, which I was trying to ask Standard for Truth, for example, with uh, crustaceans. You know, if all crustaceans belong to the same um, kind or barman, uh, we don't know. Uh, I don't know how to determine that. Um, I guess it's uh, kinds are very arbitrary. So again, the built-in heterozygosity is as, as arbitrary as kinds. That's why it's, it's not a valid argument. I, I, I literally don't take it seriously. Um, what else do we talk about? Oh, those eggs. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, those eggs, uh, I really want to know about what kind of flood dynamics could preserve an egg nest it fully formed with eggs in it, you know, um, and the sandwich between layers laid down by the flood. Uh, that's something I would like to know. Uh, we find footprint sandwich between layers. Um, were animals walking between the layers when they were being laid down? I don't know. What kind of flood dynamic can cause that to happen? Um, what else? Uh, um, yeah, I guess that's it for now. I, 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 <laughs> I can't brainstorm anything else. Uh, yeah, so that's it. All right. That's your time anyway. That's good. All right. Steak. You're closing it up. Okay. Um, so I didn't get a satisfactory explanation of any of the parts of hydrologic sorting. Um, Again, the fossil record appears to be organized in a series of transitions that are going towards modern forms and branching out in several different forms as well. Um, radiometric dating proves right off the bat uh, that, excuse me, that young Earth is uh, impossible. Um, we didn't hear much from the other side about radiometric dating this time. Um, and they also show, again, that they don't seem to understand basic geology, at least as I understand it, um, since uh, they seem to think every sedimentary layer is analogous to a geologic stratum. Uh, Neff shows pictures of mud layers at a small scale and ignores the fact that the density of 
these layers don't repeat. Um, and yet in the actual geologic column, uh, the same density, same rock layers do repeat over and over. Uh, even though the experiments he showed show that uh, water sedimentation in all experiments of this sort show water sedimentation uh, separates by density but does not repeat the layers. Um, all sediments of the same density deposit in the same layer, um, and that's why we get these gradual transition layers uh, that uh, Stunted was talking about in the short-term formations, but uh, rather abrupt layer transitions uh, in the geologic column. Um, and again, we know that they are misrepresenting geology simply by the fact that geologists explicitly reject young earth creationism. Um, genetic entropy, again, debunks the arc lineage uh, that they're trying to espouse. Uh, the explanation of the arc proves that small scale transitions seen in order in the fossil record. Um, uh, sorry, I lost lost my train of thought for a second. Um, it debunks the arc lineage specifically because um, when we ran the numbers, uh, we found that uh, small scale populations will go up by uh, genomic decay uh, within 100 generations. And this occurs in small populations. And from the arc, we have genetic bottlenecks of a single pair. And this process is made even worse by inbreeding. And this is going to occur by a single pair. Um, uh, the small scale transitions we see in the fossil record are already covered by all the transitions that they have already admitted uh, have occurred in the 4,000 years since the arc. Um, soft tissues, they say that this suggests that uh, dinosaurs have been around recently, but they ignore the paper by Mary Schweitzer, uh, the multiple papers about the preservation methods. Um, I'm not. I still am not sure what their actual objection to this is. They just dogmatically say that it's not an explanation, even though the chemistry perfectly explains everything. Um, oh, let's see. I suppose I'll. I'll, um, I'll just say that uh, nothing in their story makes sense. Uh, the fact that death came into the world. Um, after the flood, that doesn't make any, or after the fall doesn't make any sense. The, the life forms changing after the flood doesn't make any sense. It doesn't line up with the pattern that we actually see. They can't explain any of the actual transitions that we see, even though that's made possible by their model of created heterozygosity and uh, quick evolution after the arc. So um, I remain firmly on the side of the mainstream sciences. All right, time. All right, guys. Well, that was the end of the debate. It seemed to go really quick. That two minute back and forth almost seemed like it wasn't long enough. So it was a workout though. I'm tired, I'll give you that much. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty intense. Uh, so I, I need to be maybe three minutes. So <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed the debate. Be sure to check out their channels. And again, the after show is going to be on Nephilim's free channel right now. Um, I will have them try to post it in the comments section as soon as this video gets posted. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you personally want to debate, message James or leave it in the comment section and he will decide on a topic that you might like. Anyway, I hope that everyone listening has a great rest of the week and we are out. Thanks, Pharaoh Matt. <laughs>